A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, those joining us in the audience today and those joining us online. Welcome to the Head Foundation Dialogues. My name is Vignesh, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. Before we begin, today's dialogue is a special one. It is not just a dialogue, but it's a chance for us to launch the book of a man whose introduction will take the two hours that we have put aside for the dialogue. So I won't spend too much time introducing him, but instead, I will invite you all to watch the short launch video of the book that we're going to be talking about today. Thank you. Gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the short montage. Before we move to the dialogue, I'd like to invite Mr. Tan Ching Ka, the publisher of Right Editions, to share a few words about the journey that he experienced working with Mr. Veng Seriwood in putting this book together. Ching Ka, please. A very good evening. Uh, good afternoon. You see, it's evening time right now. It's afternoon time. You know, it's such a pleasure to have all of you here, you know, this afternoon. You know, in every book launch, we always talk about not the book itself, but rather the person behind the book. So this afternoon, we actually come together to celebrate the life of uh, Mr. Vink Sarevo. I call him Vink, you know, and um, I knew that uh, when I first saw him, with an introduction by our very dear friend, uh, uh, Mrs. Diana Ethan there. Can we just give her a round of applause here? Without her, this book cannot happen. All right? And because of her, we got to know one another. And what struck me um, when I first met uh, Mr. Vink was that I was looking forward so much before I met you because I was looking for someone who had gone through, you know, the genocide in Cambodia back in the 1970s. I think some of us here were not even born, right? Some of the young, young friends I have here, I think most of you are born in the 90s or 2000s. Okay, so this is 70s, right? 70s in Cambodia is very rough time. And that for Mr. Ving, who had gone through the genocide, who almost got killed 
three times. That's why he was a prisoner. He and then how how he became a a politician and how eventually became a pioneer in the area of, of education and, and many other things. So that really, really, really um, intrigued me because I'm not thinking about trying to get a book done. I'm trying to, to meet a person who is so extraordinary. So this afternoon, I think you are going to have a treat because we are going to learn from him so much about what it meant to overcome, what it meant to have resilience. So when we talk about the book itself, and of, of course, you know, this afternoon I'm very, very uh, privileged and honoured and grateful to partner with the Hip Foundation, you know, to actually launch this book together and have this dialogue. Thank you, Mr. Chanda Evanished and the team behind this whole afternoon. You know, we are going to, to learn from Mr. Vink what was his mindset, what occupied his soul, what occupied his spirit when he went through those experiences, especially how he had to face death. You know the answer? He was, he was given a gun on his temple and he was asked the question by his attacker. And if he said the wrong, wrong answer, that's it. You can't see Mr. Ving here. He will have been gone. Okay, but we want to know what went through his mind and his heart when he faced death. So for all of us here, I don't think any one of us here had the opportunity to face death. Right? Anyone had? Uh, I have not, but it is frightening, I'm quite sure. But what helped him to overcome that fear, to face death? Many of us here, we are just trying to face the next examination, maybe, right? Or maybe the next job change, whatever. But the thing is that when we face the ultimate that is death, we fear nothing else. So this afternoon, I want to thank you, you know, for joining us. And I want to pass this time back to Vinished. Vinished. Thank you very much, Inka, and you also did my job. I was supposed to introduce Mr. Ving, but I don't think much more can be said <laughs> after what Chinka has shared. So I'm just picking up the book to read. There's a long description of what Mr. Ving has achieved. And I think the fact that the book is titled No One Born Poor, Prisoner, Politician, Pioneer. I think those three phrases in itself capture the kind of person that he is. But just in this last line, and something that resonates especially with us at the Head Foundation as we look to see what we can do, our very little bit that we can do to help improve education and healthcare in the region, particularly in our home region of Southeast Asia. i just read this last line from Mr. Veng's book in his little biography. Veng Serewood hopes to actively pursue his life mission to serve, enable and help his fellow countrymen and women to love and uphold the aspirations of Cambodia. I think it's not just the aspirations of Cambodia, but it's the aspirations of all of us part of this human community. So ladies and gentlemen, it's truly an honour and a privilege to invite Mr. Ving Serebut to share his perspectives and ideas with us. Mr. Ving, please. Thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity. I think I'll talk in two parts. First, a little bit of the story, and then I go to the book. Well, with the start is thank you very much, uh, Shangda, Head Foundation, Vignesh, and all the staff for bringing uh, this occasion together. Thank you. I don't know whether you can learn anything from me. Thank you so much, uh, Jinka, for such a rich introduction. But uh, yes, uh, every time I have this opportunity to speak, to play the cassettes, the tape of my life, I sometimes wonder myself why, how this journey of my life, it's like a dream sometimes. Really happen, uh, this kind of stuff, to people? 
So here is a few snapshot shot. Taking on from Jinka and weakness in the 70s. Shock. School abruptly closed. As a child, no, a teenager, sorry, run around happily in the rice field of the remote province of Cambodia. And you can imagine at that age, this kind of thing happened to you. Tank rolled through, shot, went out. Life become death. So my mother took charge, in control, put things in perspective. One night, she whispered to me, son, we cannot stay here. There is no future here. We must run. Every bit of stuff that she said made me I am today. We ran, and before that she said, the Khmer Rouge communists, not just wearing black, but they also have a black heart. I remember so well about all those stuff, those, word, those words. So I arrived in Phnom Penh, and the only thing she have in her mind is continue your education, because communists, no education. So there I was, no roof, no nothing, no friends, no neighbor, but life goes on. You got to fill your stomachs, and you got to find money to pay for education. So the most appropriate, the most convenient thing for me to do is tricycle. We call it cyclo. Teenager, but I have to push and pull for a living. The wall, the fan of the rich become a wall of my hut over the sewage. But I don't remember anything else except to focus on life, what's confronting us. That, then I go through all these uh, three and a half years of hell, cost two million plus people, starvation, killing, execution, etc. Not enough. When the wars end, peace arrive. Just about time to move on with life, I was in prison once again. They accuse me now of being Khmer Rouge, so they put me in prison, as Jinka pointed out. I don't know. Instinct took over. I said, this is not real. They asked me a very simple question, actually. Are you Khmer Rouge or not? You have only one answer. And they took my other colleague about a few hundred meters away and sprayed with the AK-47. And they told me that he's dead. He died already. So you got to tell me the truth. Yes, the truth is when. I say the truth. I am not a Khmer Rouge. I'm a, show, I'm a student. And they let me go. The journey went on. I became refugee in Thailand. And that's when I picked through the wall, the bamboo walls, just to learn A, B, C, D. And then four years later, I was lucky enough to be resettled and become a university student. And four years later, I finished my degree in political science from Victoria University. I don't know whether I have any lesson to share with you, but I think I called my mother a commander in chief because she took over, take initiative, determined with conviction, only one aim that, ch that her children must have education. So I think that spirit, that spirit alone, 
is probably enough for a person. That reason to move on in life, regardless of what happened outside you. So I, if I may say something about what I thought at the time, is the inner game, actually. The inner me that I'm fighting again, not the outer stuff that happened to me. When I was a Ciclo man, I dropped gas at Raffle Hotel in 1973. And especially I talk to the young people here. You have a lot in your future. <laughs> but that journey of your life, anything can happen. 20 years later, in 1993, that same person, Wayne Serifut, go into that same hotel, but this time Minister of Tourism of Cambodia. It showed to us that a person's journey, a person's life, you can't say what will happen, but the determination, the conviction. When I study at Victoria, it's simply one reason that drives me through the university. I'm the son of uncle. My ancestor built uncle. I have this SIM card of uncle in me. Uncle spirit is with me. If they can do it, if they can build the temple and present it to the world, why cannot I build myself? So education at that time for me is that I don't think about what other students do or they're smarter or cleverer than me. I just simply, I just simply, if I cannot understand, I study more. If one hour not enough, three hour. If not enough, I sleep in the library. <laughs> That's basically uh, drive me through life. And I also remind, I also was reminded that when the rain came, this is later life. I, I remember all these things that the rain fall on the rich, wealthy people who, who their friend's house become a wall of my heart. But the rain also fall on the little heart over the sewage. So actually, the world, actually, it's so neutral. It gives us chance. It gives us opportunity. So if I can share this kind of thing, that this is probably not just my story, not just me, but a lot of people went through life. And a lot, a lot of people went through hardship. And this story of me, actually, I have to be very humble here. Many Cambodians went through worse than me. It's actually not my story, it's Cambodian story. Not a single family in Cambodia, not lost their family members during the three and a half years of hardship. Now coming to the book, <laughs> to the book. From, from a peasant boy, uh, through that journey, I struggled through. But then I questioned myself, hmm, what is she like? What, what is it really about? I feel that the bottom game of life is you keep doing good, and the end game of life is just to keep sharing. So I thought, well, the story I have maybe can be shared. So that is when the book idea was born. And it will not be possible that I stand up to you, stand with, with in front of you today without these people I must acknowledge. First, my good friend. Dina Ethan from Singapore, who I have worked with her when we, I now as minister, I signed the hotel that I was dropping gas off <laughs> to develop that hotel. And she was there, a part of the raffle team. So I reached out to her whether she can help me about writing this book. So it tells us here that link, network is important in life. Friendship from the heart lasts. So she said, Wayne, sure, sure, write me more. Good, good, good story. I write kind of bullet, bullet lines, eh? bullet point to her. I remember that. And then, not a pub publisher anymore, it's a good friend, Chinka Tan. She said, Dinah said, 
Come, so we meet at Clarky. Clarky, Clarky uh, for dinner. Beer, I don't drink beer very much at that time, but now since I know him well, I drink a lot of beer when I meet him. <laughs> uh, thank you, and of course, my son, maybe you can stand up a little bit, son. For the, he can, he helped me. <laughs> he helped me editing, helped me uh, uh, encouraging me. And of course, my wife uh, edit a lot of uh, stuff that the book have. So I make uh, like to end up here, so we have time for our uh, audience to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, those of you joining us on Zoom, please feel free to ask your questions uh, via the chat option, the Q&A option, and I will uh, ask your questions on your behalf. But as I was sharing earlier, uh, we are very fortunate to have a number of students also joining us today. Uh, and I hope that this is an opportunity for you to ask Mr. Ving about his journey, ask him questions. I think no questions are off limits. No, I think okay. Mr. Ving is very happy to answer questions uh, as you may see fit. But I can share one experience and, and why I was so honoured to be here. Uh, I think it was almost three months ago when I first came to Phnom Penh. And Mr. Ving was very kind to host me and a colleague for lunch. And we thought we were just having lunch with him. So Mr. Ving said, come meet me at this restaurant for lunch. I got in a grab with my colleague. I think we just landed, right? So we had just landed in Phnom Penh, took the early morning flight. Uh, got to our hotel, put our luggage down, freshened up, got in a grab, went for lunch. And then halfway through lunch, he turns to me and goes, Finish, you and Michelle, my colleague, <laughs> you come with me after this. I've got some students coming over. I would like you to meet them. So not being one to decline a very polite <laughs> offer, especially after he very kindly bought me both beer and lunch, uh, I said, sure, I'll follow you. And so Mr. Veng drives me out of the city, shows me some of the sites, explains to me the history of many of the important areas in Phnom Penh. And then I go to his, his home, uh, and, and I get to meet these students. And there are about a few hundred of them there. So I asked him, and I asked his lovely wife, I said, why are they all here? What's going on? And he said, well, this is what Mr. Veng does nowadays. These are students who come from very, very challenged backgrounds in Cambodia. Very, very challenging. And I'll share something that they said to me that really moved me during that session. And Mr. Ving just speaks to them to inspire them. You know, uh, this idea of the Angkor SIM card, I remember he shared a bit. Because his wife was very nice. She's, she sat between me and Michelle and translated for us uh, as Mr. Ving was speaking. And this idea that in each of us, there is true greatness. There's so much that we can achieve, but... Unfortunately, oftentimes we struggle to unlock our own potential. And yet someone who came from a background that I think for most of us, you know, especially those of us who grew up in Singapore, it's unimaginable to think what you went through. And the work he does now to motivate and speak to students, I just thought that it was very meaningful. And I thought if the chance arose for him to share some of this with students in Singapore, uh, students all across the region, he's going off to Kuala Lumpur in a couple of days' time. I think it's just so helpful. Because sometimes we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day struggles. We get caught up in the challenges that we face in our com so communities, in our societies, in our homes. And we forget that all of us have the ability to achieve, achieve a lot. But do we take full advantage of it? So I think that was what really inspired me and drew me to Mr. Ving an opportunity to have him come to Singapore, share a little bit <coughs> excuse me, uh, with our audience here. So now that I've spoken enough, because I want to give everybody time to prep for questions too, uh, can we have some questions from the floor, ladies and gentlemen? Anything that you would like to ask uh, Mr. Ving before we move on to questions that are coming online? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Asan from Republic Polytechnic. As mentioned before, you said you came from the Khmer Rogue and everything, and how after like the war period, to like struggle to pay for university and everything, and go to life. Is there any stage of that point where you feel like giving up, where you just that like, you had enough of life? And if so, what helped you overcome through all this hard work and give you the tenacity that you have today? Yep. Well, we are human beings. Uh, we have our up and down, um, but. I think 
I, I alluded uh, to, to it earlier, but uh, I, I, the, the journey that we have as an individual, the inner us as an individual, and the outer thing that happened to us is a separate thing. I think I even realized myself about the ability to separate between, uh, between the two. Uh, probably one of the most important thing that I, I, it helped me, okay, in my case. I, as I said to you earlier about the CCLO, I, I write CCLO for a living and for paying for my education. But I am not a CCLO man. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's the idea of understanding what happens externally that we may not be able to control, but internally is how we can control what we feel <coughs> our emotions and, and our perspectives. I hope that answers some of your questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions from the audience in the room? If not, you have to listen to me talk a lot. <laughs> so if we don't want that, do we have questions from our audience members? Yes, sir. Uh, there are a couple of mics going around, so please use the microphone. If not, you'll be like me and those online can't hear anything. Hello. Oh, yeah. So um, my name is Kosal. I am a Ca Cambodian young generation. I'm really inspired by your story and uh, how you overcome from like where you are, where you were at the past, and current day. Current uh, you were a uh, um, minister of tourism, and uh, I'm really glad that I, I have opportunity to be here and That's listen perfect. to your stories and, and your sharing. So my question to you is that. Uh, I heard you, you have opportunity to be uh, like educated in overseas in New Zealand and Australia, but what, what have taken you to, to go back to Cambodia and become a politician? And I mean, what, what, what was your thinking at that time? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gosal. Nice to, 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 to meet another Cambodian right here in Singapore. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Gosal, um, you have the chance, you have the opportunity to um, do your study, be your, educate yourself. What's the point for me uh, going eight to five uh, all my life there, 30, 40 years later, have a few children die? <laughs> that's, that's one of the factors. Secondly, I feel that I owe the country a lot. A lot. Um, so uh, this is a time for me. And those who were in the refugee camp with me never have the chance to be resettled. So in fact, when I returned, I went back to the same refugee camp I was eight years ago in 1980. So I went there to work as volunteer to help to assist. Then later on to the country joined to join the government for the uh, become public servants, right? So uh, basically, gratitude. Secondly, reason for purpose to me. If I can serve, if I can share, that is really. Uh, I wake up in the morning energized. Well, thank you. Thank you. Very <laughs> yes, ma'am, you have a question. Sorry, I was looking at the questions coming in online. I'm so sorry to be distracted. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Veng, and uh, I, welcome I <laughs> to Singapore. It's been like three, four years since the lockdown, so good to see you. Thank you. And your very grown-up boy and your beautiful wife and the whole family and every one of you from Cambodia, welcome <laughs> to you. Singapore. Uh, Mr. Veng, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you very much. I always remember how we first launched Travel Weekly Asia in 2000 and that was the time, hi Diana, that um, you were the Tourism Minister of Cambodia and we had a chat at uh, Fairmont Raffles Hotel and I was pitching to you to be the official daily and we were then a very new publication and you supported me and I owe you this and thank you very much. <laughs> That's how Mr. Veng alike and he looked at me, he listened to me and he said that, okay, I'm why still not? I'm still I, listening to you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will work with you. I think you can, you, you guys are good. We'll give you a chance and opportunity. And that's Mr. Veng. And number two, 
I think uh, we view serving the um, tourism of, uh, uh, of uh, tourism minister in Cambodia in two terms. You have done a lot and uh, an amazing achievement and uh, the wow opening dinner that is impossible and you make it happen. The ATF that you did is the best like shining event for Cambodia as well as probably during that time um, the tra travel fair. And I'm sure over here there's a lot of young um, students who will want to listen to you your achievement during your tourism term or tourism day just share with them a few of your great <laughs> achievement would you all want to listen <laughs> yes okay over to you mr Bing. thank you thank you well now now not a cyclo man anymore a, po <laughs> a, a politician now <laughs> i think what drives me is the hearts uh, that's all basically i feel that this opportunity is to do everything for the well-being of the people. I come from the proven remote part of the country myself. 80% of the people there live a little bit hard in terms of well-being. So I understand them. So now this opportunity is for me to give it all. So I just think, <laughs> Determine. Uh, remember on that story, the, the one friend said that, wow, how can Cambodian do this ATF, Asian, Asian Tourism Forum? Thousands of people, right, will be there. We have no hall, no, no, no hotel, <laughs> no conference room, no hall like this. So we do it in, in the open. Why not do it in the open? No roof, no nothing. And you ask the sky to stop the rain for one night, it should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we communicate through, not iPhone at that time, just through pray. <laughs> and they listen. <laughs> so risk, you take a bit of risk in life as well. So another one is uh, maybe this lady again, we come back to this lady. We did one thing that uh, also a very milestone event in well, in the history of the country in tourism. We have Josea Carreras coming to Cambodia in those days, you know. Uh, uh, Diana, you would like to say a few words there, no? <laughs> <laughs> she is part of the raffle who organized this thing. So maybe I just answer to your question, especially for uh, our uh, student here. I do it from my heart, that's all. Anybody can lead, anybody can do amazing things if you actually have the heart the technical part, the intelligent part, the talent part, the creativity part, the skill part come later, hard first. Okay, we have a few questions online. I know we have a few questions in the room. Let me just adjourn to some of the questions online because I think there's one that, very, that sort of builds on the earlier question, right? And this question that we have online, as Minister of Tourism, what issues have, you con have concerned you and what sort of leadership have you found to be efficient and effective? I know we have spoken about this. Tourism uh, in countries, not just in Cambodia, but globally, can be such a big driver of growth. Yet, it can be very stressful on the natural ecosystem. It can create challenges. So what, in your view, is the biggest challenge that tourism, broadly speaking, but specifically in the Cambodian context, is going to face in the coming few years? Well, for Cambodia, the world knows Cambodia as uh, killing fields because of the Khmer Rouge period, painting a very dark picture of the country. So you got to go out there and do your PR, and as what we talked about, the Asian Tourism Forum, all these things, paint a, a better picture of the country. That's one side. The second uh, part of it is actually tourism is quite basic stuff. Actually, if you talk about tourism, it's very basic. It's about leisure. It's about entertaining. It's about hospitality, service. Service we have. Asian people have great service uh, um, talent in there already. Natural, I'm sorry. And um, so uh, when I said basic, I mean uh, nature. Basically, go back to nature. Preserve, conserve. Uh, make sure that it is sustained 
and the cultural aspect is very, uh, it's an amazing cultural aspect in this part of the world. And uh, so um, uh, public policy on this aspect is to uh, conserve, to preserve, and to utilize those uh, resources, not just for this generation, but for years to come. And uh, that probably, uh, the other detail is technical, but this is the principle, this is the main stuff that you need to uh, be proactive about. I think that's very meaningful, especially when you talk about not just conserving and preserving nature or architecture, but culture. Right? Oftentimes we get lost in that, we chase the next innovation, we chase the next dollar, <laughs> we chase the next tourist, and we may preserve buildings, we may do a fantastic job of preserving the outside facing architecture, but how do we preserve that culture? That culture that made us unique, that made us a, 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 a different society. How do we preserve that? So I think that's very meaningful. As a follow-up, I think the question that the person online was asking was also, in your many years as a senior politician, what do you think makes an effective and efficient leader? <laughs> Everybody on board. <laughs> it's not a one-man show. Basically, it's uh, inclusive, cohesiveness that you have to build. So, uh, I mean, that's, we, we, cannot, we can all do that. Any managerial level can do that. Uh, it's not a one-man show. It's, uh, when I go into the ministry, I say hello to the first person. And the first person happened to be the one who cleaned the floor. That's leadership. Start from there. Very basic, actually. To be honest with you, <laughs> Not that I don't want to read leadership book, <laughs> but for my two decades of leadership, I touched not one page of leadership book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have, I never have access to. So that's why I said hard first. Then you learn on the job. You can observe. I, I use a lot of the word observe to the student mm. in Cambodia. Yes. Observe, observation. You lead the life of half glass full. But if you don't observe, you lead full, full glass kind of life. You know it all. I don't think so. Leadership, continue learning, continue observation, and that practically uh, those uh, a few important, important points in my two decade plus in government. <laughs> I think I, I have to agree with you. Not all leadership books are helpful. <laughs> uh, but let me, let me go back to the audience and ask them. Uh, do we have questions from the... I think we have... Gen uh, sir, if I ask the gentleman first, followed by you, sir. <laughs> I'm so inspired. My name is Danny. I'm from the Eurasian Association. I'm very inspired by your story. And similar to yourself, who, your mom was the one that triggered the start of how, who you are. My father actually sparked a lot in me because I was on the wrong path when I was younger. And what he did was a story to me because he brought me to countries where people were suffering. India, China, Cambodia for that matter. And we went deep in the Cambodian villages to understand and see their lives. And I share my story like that to the youth in the Eurasian Association today. All right, but many of us don't have the opportunity to see what's deep inside the world we live in. I would want your advice. Like how would, one, how would you advise us to trigger deep inside us to actually live from our heart? Like you said, everything's from the heart. <laughs> it's a deep question, it's a deep question, I know, but... <laughs> it's getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> Sorry, your name again? Danny. Daniel, right? Danny. Danny, 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 I don't know everything, please. <laughs> uh, I, I would say circumstance, pressure. When you are pushed onto the corner, you got to react. Just human instinct. When they put the gun here, you got to respond. So hardship bring the best out of you. Not necessarily that I like those experiences, but I am made out of that experience. And in life, I have never have any regret. People normally ask me, what do you regret? What, have, what one thing tell me of that you regret in life? Because they hear the story I talk here and there. I have no regret. 
For me, life is a journey, accompanied by different story according to situation in life. Deal with it. Not even a problem. It's just an issue. You need to find solution. That's all. You sleep better if you think it like that. <laughs> <You're an inspiration. laughs> Sir. Hello, Mr. Bing. Um, my name is Chai Hock. I'm from Singapore. Um, what intrigues me is you, know, you are a person of uh, great compassion, uh, very positive and optimistic in outlook, despite of all the experiences. Not so um, positive in that sense. Right? The experience themselves are quite um, difficult and challenging. But uh, you are able to look at those experiences from a, a very optimistic, very positive uh, perspective, and uh, were able to take the best from what this experience had, had offered to you. You you went back to um, uh, when you when you described Cambodia. Uh, even though, at least based on the story that you told, Cambodia has generally been quite hostile to you in terms of the experience. It was hostile. It was. Um, primarily quite negative in that sense, okay? It was a difficult environment. I'm really keenly interested in, despite of the hostility of the motherland, okay, you have only nice thing to talk about your country and, and what attracts you to go back to give all your best to Cambodia itself. So um, if you could elucidate you know, something on, on that aspect, uh, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are a passenger. Yeah. We're here for a short while as a visitor. And passenger don't stay long. But humanity lasts. So what happened to me, to Cambodia, just one of those evolution in our society, or in life, if you like. Why take it so serious? Why take it so personal? When I ride sea clothes, it's, it's tough riding sea clothes, you know? Short pen, short shirt, my back hot and uh, like uh, salt because of sweating. Mm -hmm. And when I arrive at the raffle dropping gas, they look down here like that, you know? And they just want you to go, and I, of course, I bow to them, and I bow to the guard and vacate myself. Uh, but that's not personal. That's not personal. It's just story in your life journey. At 10 o'clock, I and a few friends, of course, Ciclo, same guy, Ciclo driver, not Mercedes driver. <laughs> <laughs> and we would, we would uh, ride Ciclo, only two wheel, round the roundabout, and laughing, enjoying 10 p.m. at night. So in that kind of situation, in life, that hardship, you can still find something to enjoy life, happiness in life. So uh, I don't know whether I answer you directly. Uh, but um, if that is just evolution in our society, it's not personal, it does not meant to harm you, why you take revenge? Why you take this? I have one example. Did I say it or not? Or I'm, I'm not sure. In the Khmer Rouge, I almost died a few times. And the guy who phoned me is that leader. And his life is on the line. If I say no, he died. If I say yes, he lived. There were demonstrations against them. So they, he called me so I can take him, ref, uh, take him to refuge, right? So I decide immediately, instinct, I say, stay put. I'll be there in a few minutes. Mr. Mokbang, one of the top leadership in Cameroon. And I brought him to the royal palace, safety. I thought he was already run, uh, uh, escaped to Bangkok on the aeroplane with his boss, but I was wrong. He was not. He was stuck there, so I took him. So 
it's just humanity, basically. One life is in his blood is me, Cambodia, blood there. So I, I, I hope that this is probably give you some uh, answer to your question. Thank you. <laughs> I, yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Sheng Jie. I'm from Republic Poly. So um, after knowing your hardships and all the things that you've gone through, I just want to ask one question, which is what pushes you to like, uh, how you say, overcome everything that you've been through? What is the thing that makes, makes it like, what's the thing that motivates you to break through every hardship you've been through so far and push towards whatever beautiful life you have right now? Thank you, thank you. But I'm not, I'm not that smart. <laughs> I don't know in advance that I can do this, can do that. It's, it's, no, no, thank you, thank you for a nice word, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not that genius uh, at all, frankly. Uh, sometime tomorrow is also blur. I, I don't know what happened. But, um, uh, well, I was a refugee in 1980, and I looked through the bamboo walls and started to write ABCD. Yes, you are right, 1980. 20 years later, 2000, I shook hands with the Prime Minister of Thailand. Refugee in Thailand, Khao Yidang, the name of the refugee. And 20 years later, I was, I, I was a refugee in his country, but 20 years later, I shook with, hand with the Prime Minister of Thailand in, in, in his uh, cabinet, Istana, uh, uh, same like in, in Thailand. Do I know that? I don't know that. Do I know that after dropping gas, then I become minister of that hotel, signing that hotel? I don't know. So it's a journey. And so what is it overcome? Thank you. Uh, we all want to do that. But we, we never know what, what will, what might happen. But so I would say confronting. I always do something that is in front of me. But I know that every step I'm moving a bit, bit closer, a bit further. That's all, that's all. And have a positive attitude, as I said, about riding Ciclo, and at night I, I compete among my friends and laugh, you know. So uh, I think, after all, this is life given to us, minutes, hour, day, week. Make the most of it, that's all. But I'm not that genius, thank you. I don't know <laughs> what to... <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think you're more humble than you really are, Mr. Big. <laughs> you, you have... A certain wisdom that I think it's very hard for many of us to understand, right? I think the natural instinct for many of us, and maybe I speak for myself, is sometimes when you're faced with what seems like insurmountable challenges, you know, we, we let the challenge overcome us, yet you allow yourself to overcome it. <laughs> and I think that is, is in itself very, very inspiring. I think for many of us, you know, we, we face our own challenges and struggles, both big and small. Uh, I hope that none of us have had the challenge of having a gun put to our head ever and never have to go through that. But yet, you know, you make that decision to save the same person's life when you can. You know, and that sense of humanity, I think, is... That's in the book, that's in the it's book. It's in the book, exactly, right? That sense of humanity is, is sometimes very lacking in many of us. So let me ask a question. I think as we, we talk a lot about this and, and we sort of hear your, your story, right? It's a story that, like you said, you, you see yourself as a man journeying through life. You see yourself, experiences around you have shaped and molded who you are. Today, many people, and I just came back from Cambodia, and I ask more in relation to Cambodia, but also to many other communities, we have seen a lot of comfort in the last couple of decades. We haven't seen the kind of strife that I think the region experienced uh, in the 60s and 70s, and maybe even through the 80s. We have had a lot of benefit, yet society has many challenges. Uh, we see polarization in so many communities. We see uh, communities unable to agree. How would you speak to a world that is constantly struggling with each other? How do you speak to a world, to a region that finds it difficult to find a common identity to move forward? We, we live, unfortunately, in a world where we are allowing our personal differences 
to create so much strife? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, um, we must come back to what is humanity, what is life, what, what is us as individual, society. I think uh, that probably the, 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 the thing that we can generate a lot of explan explanation to what you've just said here. Uh, to me, uh, us, solidarity, unity, looking up for one another, caring, sharing. That is us. That is, that's who we are as human beings. But what you've said is maybe emotion, maybe uh, something else uh, that drive your action, leading to confrontation, as you mentioned. But if you real, if, if, if we, not you, if we just reflect on who we are, what are the most important thing as who we are, as I mentioned earlier, solidarity, taking care of this thing, then we become so harmonious, right? We become so uh, easy to talk, to get along, to find some common ground, right? That's, that's, that's probably if I answer to you, I would yes. answer to you in this respect. No, I, I really do appreciate that answer. <laughs> yeah. And before we ask more questions from the ground, and I think we have a few coming in online, let me ask you something totally sidetracked, a bit, a bit lighter on a lighter note, right? Because as you're talking about your achievements as Minister of Tourism, I must say he's very good at convincing people it's good. Because <laughs> after my first visit with him, I had a few days of leave that I needed to clear, I ended up back in Phnom Penh. <laughs> right, that was my holiday destination for me. So I'm going to ask you, we all know Cambodia for Angkor Wat. What else would you do on a, on a, on a trip to Cambodia? What would, you, what would you suggest to a tourist who's spending a week in Cambodia? What should you see? What must you do? Well, talk to people. See the people. See the people. Different part of the uh, country. You went to Kampung Cham. Yes. And you see how they live. Uh, you see the Mekong River that feed 300 million, 300 million, half of the Asian population, just one Mekong alone. Mm. Uh, this, these kind of things you appreciate. Actually, you appreciate life in general. You are really appreciate life. And that brings home good sleeping uh, habit. <laughs> <laughs> and wake up in the morning, energized. <laughs> <laughs> energized. <laughs> yeah, so I, if, if I can, as a s small pitch, if any of you have the opportunity and a chance, visit Cambodia. Mm. It's a fascinating country. It's a country of contradictions, yet it's a country of such immense beauty. It's a country of one of the nicest people you could ever meet, uh, yet it's a country that it's growing rapidly. You see that, that, that rapidness of development, that almost like a tipping point, it's like a boiling, you know, that there's this sense of urgency and enthusiasm, but yet there's so much peace. It's, it's such a fascinating... Talking about peace, you said, uh, Prime Minister Hun San uh, yeah. have a slogan saying, uh, thank you, peace. Uh, and this is really what Cambodian is all about. Yeah. For 20 hour years, for 20 hour years, one war after the other, from 1970 to 1990, 20 years. So yes, it's about time. Yeah. It's about time. There's peace. Yeah. In the country, <laughs> there's peace in the country, and that's that's what we just so so priceless for us, so priceless, so many suffering, more than enough, more than enough. So I think this is a question that shouldn't be too hard that we have online. How long were you a refugee and a prisoner? How did you manage to further your education to university? And what made you go into politics? I know some of these answers. <laughs> Answer already. I yeah. would say read it in the book. <laughs> but uh, maybe to those of you online who are asking these questions, hmm. this is the book. It's available online. But uh, oops, I think I dropped some. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. But maybe Mr. Ving, share a little bit. How did you manage to go overseas and further your studies? Oh, basically, it's not me. It's it's uh, being a refugee. 
you are eligible to be resettled in different parts of yeah. the world and happen to be in New Zealand. So, so I hope that answers the question online. <laughs> uh, for the other answers, check it out. I don't, I don't buy tickets, I know. <laughs> <laughs> See, clone men don't have, don't have money to buy tickets. <laughs> so sometimes it's good fortune. Do we have more questions from the room? Yes, Shinkan. <laughs> questions that have not been answered. So you are going through so much adversity, so much, one after another. Was there any simple pleasure that you look forward to ev at the end of each day, for example? So uh, there's first question. Second question I have is, um, when we decided to do the book about four years ago, did you imagine that how the book had been so-called um, received today in Cambodia and uh, what was the general response of the uh, readers reading your stories in Cambodia and how, how have their lives been impacted by your story? Okay, and third question is, you have learned so much from the day you were born until now and that if there were some, one or two more questions Lessons, important life lessons that you want to learn in the years to come, what would that be? <laughs> Thank you. So what pleasures do you look forward to at the end of every day? <laughs> well, if I can, um, if I able to do something, able to do something, or if I can do something, I find that when I woke up in the morning, I repeat this phrase, I woke up in the morning, energized. And that's, that's enough for me. That is satisfying. That's life. Second question is... Uh, the impact of the book. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Did you again, again, my, 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 I have a colleague there uh, asking me. You see, I don't know. But it's just the fact that you, with love, you, you don't calculate, but you just want to share this. I reach out to Dinah and then talking to Jinka to get the book. I don't know the response, right? But just the fact that you have this urge in you, burning desire to put this story out, to share, I do think that of benefit, but I don't know. But now I can answer to Jinka that people I don't know in hundred thousand before I wrote book, I don't know them. Now they're in my part of my life. They wrote me, it changed my life, I think different now, I'm, my, my mindset is, is different now. I got to do hard, I got to work more, I got to want to do something like you, this kind of thing. Satisfied, satisfied. And the third one, sorry. The third one you had to ask was, uh, what is the two, one or two lessons you want to learn in the rest of your life? Oh. What would you like to learn well, deeper? I, I engage. I have that attention when I meet people. Actually, people coming down to people again. Just, just fascinating to hear people talking, to hear their viewpoint, to understand where they come from. And that's already learning to me. That's nice. I mean also engage in thy, you know, with diverse. Huh? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, that's so nice. <laughs> people. I think the young man here has a question. Testing. I am not that young, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm Tommy, uh, Director of Education at CDAC. So um, I really like what you said about life being, there are no regrets, you know, whatever life throws at you, take it, look at it, look it in the eye and face it. But I just want to ask you this question, you know, what is the most complex challenge you've faced and how have you overcome it? Because I notice you're very positive, you have that can-do spirit. I'm just wondering, what is the toughest challenge? It can be personal or even in, in, at work, but I leave it to you, man. <laughs> Tell me, right? Yes. Tell me. You know, we wrote this book, it took four years. <laughs> it took four years. And let me reveal this one example and maybe answer your question, answer to your question. And neither Diana uh, nor Chinka know about this. In the middle of this book, or uh, two-thirds of the book done. 
I was hospitalized in Australia. And they don't know till now. They don't know. They don't know. For me, again, I come back to what I said to you, the gentleman at the back there. This is just a journey. Anything can happen to you. So I spent two months in Australia, still writing to you, still saying something to you. I have surgery in Australia. So uh, complex challenge, yeah, I think that, that, that's really complex and challenge because it's life. So I took it as we come, we are just here for a short while, and if I have this book to write and impact people, wow, I just love it. So the surgery keep going, that's your business. I'm writing my book. <laughs> <laughs> and he don't know. Chinka, you don't know. I just said to you today, Dinah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, that's really... <laughs> I'm lost for words and I really am. Bad. Okay. I have an interesting question online and I think it, it points to the book also. Why the title, No One Born Poor? On this planet, it doesn't matter who we are the color, the skin color, the background, the life. Given opportunity, everybody on the planet can excel. I'm actually a nobody. My situation is by just university entrance, all dropped out in my village. Not of me, genius or talented that I able to work myself up to education? No, because I escaped. I ran because of my commander-in-chief, my mother. So the job, uh, the, the, the journey just keep moving like that, right? So um, this allowed me even with this education, I should mention this word, I landed in Istana meeting the Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. When I sit there, at the back of my mind, I laugh. Really? I sit here in front of this man, not only concerned about Singapore, but he's concerned about the whole world. Tough, straight, sharp, not, 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 not frighten you, but such an imposing figure. So. Just opportunity, I made one video in Khmer. I said the difference in life is opportunity. No cochlear is, ah, yeah, sorry. People are different because opportunity. So from this simple belief in me, I able to talk to, to thousands of students as he already witnessed uh, there. So uh, I, would, I would say this is enough for the answer. Yeah. yeah. So I think sometimes it's opportunity, right? <laughs> Some of us are more fortunate, but opportunities are there. It's whether we take advantage of it or not. Right? Many of us don't always take full advantage of the opportunities that are there for us. Do we have any more <coughs> excuse me? Do we have any more questions from the audience? If not, I'll ask a few more online. Yes. Young man. No, so, he's, he's, he's young man. <laughs> no, he's a young man. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> so during the Khmer Rouge, right? Um, could you tell us more about your mentality during uh, face when faced with like hunger and poverty? Mm. Very good question. Very good question. Wow, it's it's coming back real, real here, alive, right here. You know, I tied a string on the ceiling. I have no energy left. Nothing left. So. Sometimes food comes, sometimes don't come. So when some food ends, uh, whatever there, I would pull myself up and eat. But so alert here, so alert here. I say, this is not real. This is not real. When I look out, I saw trees, fruits, uh, rice field with plenty of fish, full of fish. 
This is not real. This is man-made. I refuse to accept man-made. And when wrong thing happen like this, unjust, it will not last. That's what went in my mind. And that keep me going. I don't just because of that and then everything falling apart. No, because this is not real. It is not real. And yes, one year about later and all things collapsed. Then I able to uh, be myself again, you know, moving on. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah. Not, not, uh, not enough, please. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. yeah. uh, can you tell us about your morning routine and your night routine? <laughs> <laughs> no, you are smarter than me. Or not. You are a lot smarter than me. My, uh, yeah, yeah. Having, having, having answered this, um, the way you structure your question, the way you pick the question, uh, to me, um, it show, it show a lot about something in here of, uh, of you. So uh, I would say in reverse, this man have a bright future. A lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot on for him. A lot, a lot, a lot for him. Yeah, thank you. But mm. yes, do share a bit. What's, what's your daily routine like? <laughs> I'm not going to let you get away without answering the question. I mean, I know if Chinka's around, your daily, your night routine involves no, a lot of beer. I'm a bit, I'm a, I'm a bit, a bit humble to, to, <laughs> to, 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 to say something like I know everything. Frankly speaking, I don't know. I'm just a normal <laughs> human being. <laughs> uh, well, um, very close to nature. Very close. Uh, my friend uh, there, uh, Jinka Daina, was in my, uh, were at my home at different times. I love nature, full of trees. I have five to 800 trees I've grown around my house. And so uh, I love the sun. When I build a house, I talk with architecture, space, sun, River, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, air, fresh air. So I grow and I, I brush my grass, I broom, I do this kind of thing in the morning because to me, to me that is just, just the beauty of life. You're able to touch, you're able to do, because we are nature, we're part of it, yeah? And we are we're able to mix ourselves together with that. It's just so blessing to life. It's really life. So morning. <laughs> Evening, um, yes, a reflection. A reflection. Not about somebody doing bad. No, no, no. A reflection about who and what else, what wrong I've done. Can I do it better? Can I, do, can I help more? What else can I be so kind to this or that person? And that's, that's so beauty, so beautiful. And the next day, I feel even better to do more things. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's certainly an inspiration for many of us. Mm. You know, if we wake up each day thinking what we can do better, you feel what energized. What we can yeah. do to help others, mm. I think that really energizes us. Mm. I'm going to ask a cheeky question that was asked online. Hope you don't mind. It was asked, Minister, who is in charge of your home? <laughs> we split, we split, we split. split. <laughs> so whoever asks this question online, you got an answer. It's a split. We split, it's we a split. split. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, do we have any more questions that we would like to ask? Yes, sir, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew. Uh, Bing, it's very nice to Andrew. see you here in uh, Singapore again. Uh, when I was uh, first uh, introduced... Uh, uh, by Chinka, you cannot, uh, to you, your books and your ideas. Actually, I went to YouTube you know, and, uh, and I watched you over YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're speaking with uh, such a passion and energy about the youth. And even just now, you know, whenever you engage young men, you gotta, I can see that special feeling you, know, you, you have for them. No one born poor. Now, what is, what is your hope? for the youth of uh, Cambodia? And currently, what are their challenges? They are going to be the best of the best. 
they're going to be the best of the best. They're going to be these people who carry the, the generation, you know, this country forward, the people forward, even that gentleman sit next to you. That's not just, just the belief, you know, in them. I feel that, like, like, like fire within me. I, uh, when I spoke to them, it, it's actually fire in me. I, I have that. Uh, and uh, the second uh, question. The, the biggest challenge that they would be oh, facing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think the government's uh, very supportive of education. Prime Minister Hun Sen, very supportive of education. So we have public education, we have private education, we give a lot of uh, incentive to, uh, for them to have access to education. I went to the province, this is another thing, I went to the province, I talked to about 1,100 uh, students in one of the college. And uh, they uh, actually simply want to be part, want to play a role. Mm, so, uh, Amazing when you have this, uh, uh, your human capital, you know, so committed to uh, take part in developing the country and all that. You just feel that uh, the future of this nation, the future of them, it's uh, in good hand, in good hand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Before we, we slowly bring to this set. Ah, yes. Hello, uh, <laughs> Mr. Wing. I'm Casper. I'm from uh, Republic Poly. Um, just now when we talk about unity, uh, we can't help it but to mention about differences as well. So when we, we talk about differences, that means we have um, actually forgotten the fundamental fact that our common ground is uh, humanity itself. So if you do agree, how, what are the ways that you would suggest to convey this message to um, promote or to, to promote more unity, per se, among people? Me, I start with each individual. Each of us, each of us have a role to play. Each of us have uh, responsibility uh, to uh, bring about um, harmony within society. You're talking about a lot of uh, rough, tough uh, thing. And these generations uh, continue to face, right? Uh, so it, when, it is even more urgent for us to do our part. How? Well, we can find a way. We can find a way. If you had a chance to speak to young people, a group of young people, one piece of advice. What would be one piece of advice you give to a group of young people in Singapore? They have every chance. They have every opportunity to grow themselves, to advance themselves, and to play a role in the society. Every one of them. To all the young people here, <laughs> you have a big role to play in our society. I mean, all the young people. Eh? <laughs> 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 to the older ones. <laughs> to the older ones have an even bigger role to support the young. <laughs> Ensure that the young have these opportunities to make a difference. Hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have had a very, very rich discussion uh, and a very good opportunity to engage with a speaker who I think I very rarely have lost for words when I moderate these sessions. I very rarely am inspired and moved as I am today. Uh, and it's been a true honour for someone like me who has been very, very fortunate to have all the opportunities given to him in life to meet someone who tells a story, a narrative, one that is truly remarkable. It is really brings to mind this idea that you know, it's a life well lived. It's a life given in service of others. It's a life dedicated to help his community. And that has always been something that ever since I, I've had a chance to meet Veng, I think the first time we met was just before COVID, <laughs> uh, somewhere in the tail end of 2019 or early 2020. We were talking about launching this book, but unfortunately COVID came, so we couldn't. And we caught up in Cambodia earlier this year. And I think all of us have these opportunities. You know, one way or the other, you know, we face our own challenges day to day. 
but it's how we choose to overcome them. So as we draw today's session to an end, uh, for those of you in the audience, we can adjourn and, and have a chance to converse more with Mr. Veng over some uh, food that we have. Uh, those of you who have books and would like them to be signed, he'll be around. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, I think, I hope that for all of you who are joining us in person, and especially those of you who had a chance to join us online, that today was a start, a start for us to understand our place in this journey. Right? We are all voyagers on a journey. We are trying to find our place. Sometimes we burden ourselves with things we can't change, rather than focusing our energies on what we can. There's so much within us that we can change. And I urge all of you, if you have the chance, peruse the book. I, I'm not, I get no commission from this. I brought this up to Chinka before, but <laughs> never got any commission. But peruse the book, read it. Because there are narratives in there that will inspire us, that will move us to want to change. Change what we can. Don't worry ourselves about what we can't change. Change what we can. So please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in thanking Mr. Veng Sarewood for sharing his ideas, his purpose-driven life with all of us. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.